Hello and welcome, I'm here to talk about the Sinkerfield Cup that is about to start tomorrow and to take you through the players and uh, what, what's happened in the past. Well, this is the scene from last year. As you can see, a not very happy Nakamura, not very happy Topalov, not very happy Carlson, and one guy who beat everybody in uh, Fabio Caruana. Uh, th those two at the back aren't players. And uh, so, as most of you probably know, Caruana played one of the great performances of all time last year at the Sinkerfield Cup. Uh, he finished with eight and a half points out of ten games. He started with seven out of seven. There's, uh, in my, at least in the modern era, there's only one comparable performance ever, and that was Anatoly Karpov back in uh, Linares of 1994. And uh, that was a, a tournament filled with Kasparov and uh, Shirov, Gelfand, all the top players of that era. And uh, Karpov finished two and a half points clear. It, last year at the Sinkfield Cup, uh, Caruana finished three points clear of the field uh, and it, he really should have won a couple more games that he didn't win so it was the nearest you can get to a, a perfect chess performance uh, so since then things haven't gone completely well for uh, Fabiano uh, after he won the uh, Sinkerfield Cup last year he was ranked world number two but uh, well it's pretty hard to live up to that sort of result every time you come out and certainly he, he has had some good performances, but he's also had some rather disappointing ones. Uh, the, the most significant events really were that uh, he qualified for the candidates tournament along with uh, Hikaru Nakamura. So he will be one of the eight uh, who will play off to challenge Carlsen for the world championship. And he also uh, transferred his allegiance from uh, Italy to the United States. Um, some of you may have seen a big article, excellent article today in the St. Louis Dispatch, uh, the Sunday edition, which comes out on Saturday, which seems a bit strange for an Australian, but <laughs> obviously that's the, the, the trend here. And uh, yeah, it certainly, it, anyway, it's a full page article on, uh, on Caruana. It gives you a bit of a history about the transfer. Um, the, the journalist has found about as much information as you can find out. Uh, the, you know, it, it seems as if it was a, a multi-year million dollar offer to Caruana to get him to change, but uh, nobody's really confirming that. Well, <laughs> what we do know is that uh, he turned down some significant other offers. Um, Italy were actually had supported him for the last 10 years, uh, or most of the last 10 years while he was playing for them, because he, he moved over to Europe where, when he was just a teenager, and soon after that the Italian Federation started offering him money for training. I think by the time he he left, he was uh, getting about 80,000 euros a year, which is uh, over $100,000. And um, it, it, was, and it, it was well spent. I mean, he, he has had a number of very good trainers. Uh, Vladimir Chuchilov was the standout. Um, Vladimir Chuchilov was his trainer when he, he won the uh, Sinkerfield Cup. And uh, well, it, certainly Caruana's move back to the US wasn't so surprising, but he'd definitely been uh, re recruited, if you like. Uh, people had wanted him to come back for, for a while, but it was also a little bit of a surprise because he, he did seem uh, quite, quite happy playing for Italy. But I guess sometimes there's offers made that are too good to refuse, and this seemed to be one of them. Okay, so I should start at the top, actually. I should start with Magnus Carlsen because he is the star in any tournament he plays in the modern era. His stats are absolutely astonishing. From 2010 in the tournament in uh, Bilbao, actually this was, the, this was Carlson's last bad result and it, he was a third place in a four player tournament. It was called the Grand Slam Final. In fact it was originally planned to be a Grand Slam Final shared between Shanghai and Bilbao but the first half in Shanghai clashed with New York Fashion Week, so Carlson was unavailable for it. As some of you know, he, he signed a contract with G-Star Raw, so he had to model some clothes uh, at New York Fashion Week. And so they rearranged the setup of the tournament and they let Anand and Carlson automatically qualify for the Bill Bow leg, and the other players had to fight it out in a sort of preliminary stage in Shanghai. Um, the players who made it through were Kramnik and, and Shirov, uh, Aronian missed out, for example. But uh, 
Okay, he, in that tournament coming straight from New York Fashion Week, Carlson didn't do terribly well. He lost to both Kramnik and Anand and finished third, not a very good third. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, he went on an astonishing run of tournaments. Uh, since that tournament, which was September, October 2010, until June this year, he did not finish lower than second in any tournament he played. And because he's a very active world champion, that is well over 25 tournaments. So it is an amazing run of consistency. If he doesn't win, for example, as at the Singapore Cup last year, he came, uh, comes second. And the result of that astonishing consistency has been that his world ranking has gone up and up and up. And it's broken Gary Kasparov's record of 28.51. Uh, at one point, I believe Carlson got to about 28.82 which is a freaky sort of rating. Uh, it's come back to the pack a little bit, and that's mainly because of his last outing, which was Norway Chess, the first leg of this Grand Chess Tour. So the Sinkerfield Cup this year is part of what's called the Grand Chess Tour. It's not so grand yet. It involves Norway Chess, Sinkerfield Cup, and the London Classic. Those three tournaments that all existed last year, they're coordinated. Uh, what's happened is the tournaments of uh, at least the Sinkerfield Cup has very slightly reduced its prize money, but it's put the extra prize money into a pool for the best performer from those three events in the Grand Chess Tour. Now, next year, I believe they plan to have a, a bigger ch chess tour. Also, the design of the chess tour is, uh, well, the most important thing to get was to get it going, I think, and therefore they, what they tried to do was sign up the best players in the world, and the, uh, they managed to get, well, nine out of the top ten basically and uh, those players play, all play in uh, each tournament and you have one wild card. The wild card in uh, the tournament here in St. Louis is Wesley So who happens to be world number seven. Uh, he was outside the top ten when the selections were done for the, the Grand Chess Tour at the start of the year but uh, he's forced his way into the top ten so have a number of other players like uh, Ding Li Ren from China, but uh, it, it, it's a, it means it's a tremendous addition to the tournament. So it makes the Sinkerfield uh, Cup the strongest tournament of the West World Chess Tour tournaments because suddenly their wild card is actually a top 10 player. So at the Sinkerfield Cup this year, you have, uh, if you, on, on the rating list, you've got seven of the top eight in the world, plus uh, numbers nine, 11, and 24. If you look at the, the live ratings, it's even more impressive because uh, Vache Le Grave, the num uh, world number 24, has actually just won a big tournament in Beale and moved up to world number 16. Uh, there have been some other slight changes. Um, uh, Ding Li Ren has actually overtaken, um, I think, Wesley So um, and pushed up to world number eight or, or seven. Number seven, yeah. Oh, that's right, he won last night, didn't he? So, yeah, uh, so uh, in fact, uh, there's, there are two players in the, top, in the live top 10 who are not here, but when you consider that the world number 11 is Levon Aronian, who everybody would regard as very much a top 10 player, uh, Aronian's been world number two for nearly five years, actually, until a pretty catastrophic slide over the last year and a half uh, down to number 11. Uh, and we'll, that, that'll be one of the, the questions in this tournament, whether Aronian can, can come up. But anyway, back to Carlsen. So, uh, got as high as 28.82 uh, rating. Now, of course, you can't really compare that with, say, Bobby Fischer's 27.85 because of, uh, there's, there's a much disputed question of how much the ratings have inflated, how much the players have got better because of computers and so on. If you, if you compare current ratings to the 1970s, you're looking at something, uh, inflation of something like 160 to 180 points, of which probably a third is due to uh, computers and general uh, strength of competition and about two thirds is due to inflation. So you'd probably say Fisher's 2785 is fractionally ahead of uh, Carlson's 2882. Uh, when, when um, Kasparov actually got to his 2851. He he uh, he actually said, "I think this is probably about equivalent to 
Fisher's 2785. I mean, it's, it's hard to know these things exactly, but he, the, the, the 2785 by Fisher is, is a simply a, astonishing a result because of the distance he was ahead of his peers, uh, and in particular the 20 game winning streak he went on. Uh, the last games of the interzonal where he qualified for the candidates matches and the two six, six zeros in the candidates matches. I mean, it was just, it's a sort of streak that nobody has managed to do. Uh, the nearest you get was perhaps the seven in a row by Caruana, but certainly uh, Fisher's rating it was way ahead of anybody else's. Now, you, you could say that was at a, a, not a peak period for, for chess, but I think uh, at the time, players like uh, Spassky and Larson were certainly not pushovers, and uh, it was it, it's still, it was very very convincing. So maybe Carlson has has he certainly got the record rating in stats. Whether it's uh, the best will be left to the historians to argue about. And and those who are questioning you know, whether Carlson's the greatest of all time, I just say leave him alone for five years or ten years, and then you can look back and and decide whether. Um, he beats Kasparov on longevity, whether he beats Fisher on, on strength above the rest of the field. But the fact is right now he is only rated 28.53 and he is only about 35 points ahead of the field. So, and that is the result of, of his performance in Norway chess in June where he lost four games. Now, many of you will have sort of seen the, the story of that tournament which was really the first round where Carlsen plays an absolutely terrific positional game sets up a winning position, uh, gets to move 60 where, when he's on the verge of checkmating his opponent, decides to wait until he gets a bit of extra time on the clock so that he can double check all the variations. And uh, then uh, when his clock runs out of time, he discovers there isn't extra time on the clock at move 60 because the Grand Chess Tour happens to be playing, played at a special time limit without the bonus time at move 60, unlike most tournaments on the circuit. So uh, he lost that one on time and he really didn't recover. Uh, Carlsen is really renowned for his mental toughness but that was too much for him. Uh, he certainly, immediately after the game, he, he said it was all his own fault, he should have checked and so on. In fact, he would have known if he hadn't been a bit late for the game. Uh, so, but certainly uh, the fact that he was a bit late for the autograph session shows that he hasn't really changed his, his habit of strolling up a, a bit late Fisher style. So uh, he's, he certainly uh, was punished for that because the arbiter had announced the time limit uh, just before the start of the round, but Carlson wasn't there. But um, a day or so later, Carlson was, I, I don't know, de deflecting the blame a little bit, uh, sort of suggesting the organisers could have done more to explain it to the players, which, it, which is of course true, but uh, ultimately it's your own responsibility. And uh, anyway, as a result of that, the next day he had to turn up play black against Caruana, which was not a lot of fun. He lost that, he lost to Anand a few days later, and he lost to his second uh, John Ludwig Hammer in the last round. So that, that was the most disastrous performance he'd had for many, many years. Uh, he finished in the bottom half of the field, uh, and in fact his chances of winning this Grand Chess Tour are really not great, even if he wins the last two events. Uh, it just requires one other player who did well in uh, Norway to keep, keep finishing second or third and Carlsen may not be able to, to catch them. So it was a huge shock uh, that he played that badly because as I say, five years, and in those five years he'd also beaten Anand twice for the world title. So he, he really hadn't put a foot wrong. Um, there was a very amusing quote uh, by Raymond Keane after the, he's an English chess writer, after the Norway result and that was something along the lines of um, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've always had my doubts about Ma uh, Magnus's strength or something like that. Uh, and, it, well, one bad result every five years, I think we can forgive. But it will be interesting to see, can, it, has he fully recovered from that, uh, that, that blow in Norway? Because for the first time it did seem as if he was human. That, that uh, Magnus, you know, the players could sit down and think, maybe I can beat him. And okay, he was at, at a sort of moment of psychological fragility but uh, he certainly was, well, not the, not the same player that we'd seen dominate for so many years. And if we recall, 2015 had been one of his really good years. He'd won the big tournament in Vikanse. He'd uh, won uh, a big tournament in Baden, Baden in Germany. Uh, that was after a playoff against Arkady Nidic, but he'd come through that playoff. 
He'd won a, a really uh, serious tournament in Shamkir, the Gashimov Memorial. That was uh, chased all the way by an and, but in the end, Carlsen came out on top. So to come seventh in, in Norway chess was just, just really shocking. So we'll see how we, uh, we go. So um, I'd like to actually have a look at um, the, the sort of game that made Carlsen famous. Uh, and this is an old game. This is 11 years ago. And if you realize that Carlsen right now is 24 years old, uh, it, it, yeah, this is a very young Carlsen. And uh, it's the, the sort of game that uh, people saw when they saw the, uh, well, if you recall, Bobby Fischer played at the age of uh, 13, the game of the century against Donald Byrne. Uh, this, this was Magnus's uh, effort and it was quite uh, convincing. Okay, so he's playing against Sip Sipke Ernst. Uh, it's a tournament in Vikanze. Uh, this is the third Grandmaster group. So Magnus is not qualified for uh, the top group, which he's been dominating recently. But in Vikanze in Holland in January, uh, when they've got enough money, they hold three Grandmaster groups on a promotion system. So if you finish the top of the group, you qualify for the B group, which is what Carlsen managed to do. Okay, Sip Kjernst, I'm not sure if he was Dutch champion back then, but he was one of the up and coming Dutch players at the time. And so, well, you would have thought this was a, a fairly even matchup. So a Bishop F5 line, one of the most solid lines. H4, uh, it's better to do that than to play Knight F3 immediately. Um, after Knight F3, we can go uh, Knight F6 and now answer H4 with Knight H5. And there's no problems for black here. So you need to get your move order right with white here. H4, H6, Knight F3, now we're threatening Knight E5. So you need to play Knight E7 and we're right in the main line. Queen takes. Now the old line here for black was to go queen c7 and castle queenside. The way people do it nowadays is to go kingside. Bishop f4, that's asking for queen a5 check if uh, black wants to play it to drag the bishop back to d2. But Ernst decides just to get the pieces out since he doesn't want c7 for his queen. Queen a5 and now knight e5. Not, not considered uh, quite as sharp as knight e4, but you'll see the way Carlsen plays it. Rook d8, take, take. L all looks completely normal. And it is. You, now the typical plan here for white is to try to play g4 and g5 and attack that way. Black will try and play c5 and break through in the center before white really gets going. But White stepped out of the way with the queen, queen e2. And that's, if you like, an extremely high class trap because black decided to play c5 anyway and was punished terribly for it. So, knight g6 played by Carlsen. It, it's quite possible that Ernst knew about this idea uh, because this line had been quite trendy at the time. And there had been an earlier game in this line which had finished up as a draw, a rather remarkable draw, but even so. Uh, perhaps Ernst had seen that, thought, okay, I'm all right, but um, all right, here, you, in practical terms, especially uh, playing someone who seems to have prepared it, it's probably better just to play rookie eight here uh, and give up the, the bishop. And white, white will have an edge, uh, taking on e7, taking on c5, but it's not huge. But, of course, you want, to be, you want to see what happens. So he took the knight. Check. Now, you can't save the bishop uh, because if rook f7, you just take on g6, so you play king in the corner. And this is where you can easily go wrong with white. Now, if you take the bishop, black will play knight to d5 and win the bishop on f4. So this is not Carlsen's idea. His idea is to take on g6. Now he's got ideas not only of taking the bishop, 
<coughs> but of setting up some sort of sacrifice on H6. And that's the really dangerous thing, something taking on H6. So the defence found by Black was knight G8, and here it looks safe enough. But Carlson starts sacrificing again. Takes. Takes again. And Queen takes. Now that's threatening checkmate on H7. So there's only one reasonable way to stop it. Block with the knight. Remembering, of course, black is a rook and a knight up, so you can afford to give a bit back. And this is the position where white had previously made a draw. Check, king moves, rook here. Looks like it's setting up a mate, but knight h6 blocks everything. The queen thunder attack, when it moves, threatening mate, you go knight back again, and you've got nothing better than queen f6 here, because if you take on, uh, on f7, we just take back with the rook, remembering that rook on d8 is protected. So queen f6 and draw. Now, OK, uh, apparently um, someone has analysed this position and found that white can actually play rook h3. Oh, no, rook h3 here? Yeah, to try to play for a win, but it's extremely optimistic. But Carlson found something much better. He just took on f7. So you have to start running with the king. Otherwise, there's queen f6 check and rook h1 mate. So king runs. And now it looks as if... Black is going to get away. Remember that rook takes f7 is threatened. Um, you could play rook h1 here. Perhaps with the idea rook takes pawn queen g5 check. But after rook h1, I presume black will take the pawn on d4. So let's see, rook h1. Perhaps we take here and our queen can come across covering all the, the white queen checks. And uh, probably black's just about OK there. But rook d3, it's scary because there's a back rank mate that white might suffer if you're not careful, but at the moment the queen covers that square. So there's only really um, one way to cover the, uh, the rook g3 check, which is coming and that is to try to block with a rook, remembering that uh, the queen can't take that rook on d6 because of the checkmate back down on e1. Um, later they decided queen b6 is the best chance to hang on uh, and after rook g3 check, well, um, just put the queen in the way. But, okay, this ending must be hopeless because white has connected pawns and, and a lot of them, actually a lot of extra pawns. So the two rooks really won't stand a chance against the queen um, because of uh, white, white's pawns running on the king side. You'll lose f7, but, or you'll probably lose f7, but you'll be doing fine anyway. So rook d6, rook check, rook g6. And again, if we swap rooks and take the rook on f8, there's the back rank mate. So again, white has to be super fast. Queen check here. King moves. And now the main point of the whole combination, queen f5 check. It looks like you should play rook check, but then king g8 and there's no follow-up. But queen f5 happens to win by force. So if the king goes to e7, you check again with the rook on e3. And um, if rook f6, which is what happened in the game, the classic epaulette mate. Epaulette being French for shoulder pads. So the king is mated with shoulder pads. And uh, that's, well, it was a fantastic attack by Carlson. The only possible criticism you could have is maybe it was preparation. Uh, but it's, it's always hard to tell. And to be honest, uh, probably the chances that it were preparation are not that high. Although the line was reasonably trendy, it was more likely to have been investigated by a Karakan player rather than someone with white. Um, but, but it's not impossible that this uh, sort of attack appeared on, on Carlson's home analysis board. But nowadays you have to sort of disregard whether you regard that as um, 
as admirable or not. Of course, it's better that uh, you've, you find these attacks out by yourself rather than uh, prepare them at home. But some of the really fantastic attacks, like uh, Anand's win against Aronian a couple of years ago, that the idea had been found uh, when Anand was preparing with a computer. But uh, the, the more amazing thing about the, that game was that Anand had actually forgotten a lot of the analysis. So he had to remember or work out at the board exactly what it, the reason why this wonderful line worked. And, uh, and he finally did work it out. <coughs> so that game, 2004, really announced Carlson's arrival on the scene. Uh, he won the C group. He, he qualified for the B group. He won that. He went into the A group. Uh, he actually had a, a bad result in the A group the first time he came out and the second time he came out he won it. Uh, and really since then it's been an almost non-stop run of success for Carlson. Uh, played um, a series of Olympiads. He's one of the few players to have only played Olympiads on board one for his country. Uh, he entered the team in, when was it? Chu, no, Calvia, 2000, this year, 2004. Cal, uh, he played the Olympiad uh, yeah, later in the year uh, for Norway on board one. Uh, this was a, well, a, a classic uh, Olympiad where he was actually already committed to playing a tournament in Holkevein in the Netherlands, which took up the first four or five rounds of the Olympiad. So the team agreed that uh, he should um, come in as, as early as he could and miss the first rounds and the rest of the team would do their job while he was waiting. And uh, he, he happened to be, uh, the Norwegian team happened to be staying at the same team as the Australians. And uh, when he arrived, about five days later, he went to the registration desk at our hotel and he, he came up and said, I'd like to get a player registration card, please. And they looked at him and said, um, Look, you know, I'm sure one day you'll, you'll be able to be a player, but uh, we'll, we'll, you'll have to get a spectator card, I'm sorry. And uh, he said, no, 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 I'm a player. I play for Norway. And they, they knew, of course, the Olympiad had already been five days old, so there's no way he was a player. And uh, so they said, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, you'll, have to, you'll have to watch. And uh, this is not for everyone to play. And uh, so Carlson had to go up to his room, get his dad, bring his dad down. I say, yes, really, really, he is a player. And he finally got his player registration badge and was allowed to play for Norway. But uh, yeah, this, this happens when you're too good, too young. People don't uh, quite accept you. But uh, anyway, so he's now played five Olympiads. The last was at Tromso, his home territory in 2014. Really disappointing result for him. Uh, he, he lost uh, a couple of games, one in particular against uh, the Serbian player Saric was a, a real upset, probably the lowest rated player he'd lost to for a long, long time. Not that he gets to play low rated players that often, but uh, it's, he was so disappointed he, uh, he left the Olympiad with one round to go uh, with, with the agreement of his team, but it was uh, not a huge success. And uh, he's also won every chess Oscar from 2009 to, to now which is the Oscars sort of the outstanding achievement for the year award. It doesn't always go to the highest rated player. Uh, if someone's achieved something really good, uh, they, they could win it. So Caruana could conceivably win the 2014 Oscar for, for his Sinkfield Cup result, but uh, they haven't announced that, that yet. He's also won uh, a number of awards, the sort of thing in, that um, I don't think a chess player would, pro would get in the US. Uh, Things like the, the Pierre Gint Award uh, that was a couple of years ago for contributions to Norwegian culture. He's been nominated as Sportsman of the Year, though that was quite controversial actually and ultimately they had to uh, uh, sort of amend the categories a bit or at least they put him in a particular category where he was certain to win rather than in the, in the, ge the general one where uh, chess wasn't totally accepted as, as a sport over there. Um, chess is probably accepted as a sport in the bulk of uh, European countries. There's actually a court case going on in, in England at the moment. Uh, it's mainly by bridge, but chess has joined in about whether uh, chess and bridge should be regarded as sports. Um, but the trend seems to be going the other way in Europe with, um, for example, Germany 
defunding the Chess Association after many decades uh, because they've uh, accepted the European definition of a sport as only involving uh, physical activity or something like that. So it's not a, uh, a done deal. So it's not that um, Australia and the US are isolated in not accepting chess as a sport. It's, uh, it's still a, a debated point. But uh, I suspect if the court case in England goes the way of bridge and chess, then uh, that will have an influence in other Anglo countries perhaps, but, but we'll see on that. But certainly uh, Carlson's, uh, well, he, he's, won, he's won enough uh, awards anyway. He, he was one of Time's 100 most influential people in 2013. Yeah, he's really, uh, at 24, he's done an amazing amount of things. And probably the other big achievement I should mention is that last year, uh, he not only had beaten Anand in the world to take the World Championship title, but he then played the World Rapid Championship and the World Blitz Championship in Dubai, and he won both of them. So he's, he wins everything. Uh, it, it was a big shock when he didn't win the Sinkfield Cup last year. Uh, it was an even bigger shock when he actually played badly in Norway. So we will see. It, it would be amazing if he didn't uh, play well here. Um, you always expect him to win. In fact, um, I think the bookmakers have got him uh, at uh, about equivalent favourite to the rest of the field. So it's, it's probably reasonable odds too. But there are a few challenges. So, OK, if we go down the rating list next, the number two, to many people's surprise, is a veteran, 45-year-old Viswanathan Anand. Now, Anand appears to have been around forever, and that's because he has. Um, he, he was an outstanding player as a teenager. In fact, he became a world championship candidate uh, at the age of 19, I believe. He played against Anatoly Karpov, a really tough match, which he only lost by a, a single point. He had plenty of chances in that match. A few years later, or uh, well, five years later, he qualified to play against uh, Gary Kasparov in the, um, a big match in New York. He was really beaten heavily in that match although the first half it went really well for him. Uh, and then there was a period when he had a lot of uh, unlucky breaks. Um, he qualified to play against Karpov for the FIDE title in 97, and he lost that match on a tiebreaker. It was 3-3, and then he lost the rapid games, which was unheard of since he was the, the best fast chess player in the world. Uh, but he had just come off a month uh, worth of uh, knockout games and Karpov didn't have to play any of them. So it was, the odds were stacked against him, but uh, even that was an incredibly brave performance where he was down 3-2 uh, down with one to play and he won that critical game, and, but just didn't have the energy to win the tiebreakers. Finally, in the year 2000, he won the FIDE Knockout World Championship, which was... Uh, the sort of rival to Garry Kasparov's match title at uh, the same year that uh, Vladimir Kramnik beat Kasparov and took the match title. And at the time it was thought there was real chances that the chess world might reunite because Kramnik and uh, Anand were both very reasonable people and we thought they might unify the, the world title. But they were also both very happy being world champion, I think. And uh, so that the situation with the split world championship continued. Uh, Kaspar, uh, rather, Anand um, finally won a tournament world championship that FIDE had introduced uh, in 2007. And then finally he got his match against Kramnik in 2008 and he absolutely crushed Kramnik. Uh, won that match very, very convincingly uh, by I think it was a two-point margin, but it could have been even more. And uh, I think Kramnik won a consolation game near the end. But uh, a really very powerful performance. And since then, it seemed like uh, Anand has struggled to, to match that form. So yeah, his next match against Topalov was a terrific match, actually. Vessel and Topalov played extremely well, probably outplayed Anand for much of the match. And Anne just hung in there. Finally, uh, the, it came down to the final game. It was five and a half each. And Anne had black in the last game. It looked like the match was Topalov's to win. It looked like Anand was down and out. And Topalov just pushed a little bit hard. 
and uh, the result was uh, it was Anand who came up with a, a mating attack and retained his title. It was a uh, astonishing finish really. Um, afterwards there were some very odd things said uh, to Palov. Well, he, he, he definitely said he didn't want to play the Rapids but then to the Bulgarian media at a separate press conference he said he didn't want to play the Rapids because the Rapids were going to be held on Friday the 13th and he'd already lost against Kramnik in a Rapid match on Friday the 13th and he didn't want it to happen again. Uh, so on those little things maybe world titles can be decided. Anyway, so after that uh, Anand had another title defence just two years later against Boris Gelfand even tighter, that one went to 6-all and then fell behind, broke back almost immediately. Uh, really tough match, Gelfand was phenomenally well prepared. Gelfand is one of these guys who uh, in a way the chess world passed him by a bit because he was incredibly strong through the 90s and the early 2000s but there was practically no world championship to play for. He wasn't cut out to be a knockout player very much and yet it was almost impossible for him to get into the, the, uh, the Kasparov side, the match title. Um, there are all sorts of contracts that FIDE made you sign that you wouldn't play the other, other championship and so on. So uh, at one point he said, look, I've just had 10 years of my chess life where I accepted I couldn't become world champion. And uh, so he, he, Gilfan finally made it through. It was a big shock when he qualified from the candidates. He beat Grishuk in the final. Uh, it was really extraordinary to see someone in his 40s uh, making it all the way through. And Gelfan prepared exceptionally well. He played well and only lost two and a half, one and a half in the rapid playoff. And even then, one of the draws, uh, Gelfan was that far from winning. Uh, it was just a matter of simple technique in a rook ending and. Gelfand saw a ghost and allowed Vichy to draw. So it was an incredibly close call for Anand in that match against Gelfand. For those of you who haven't seen it, I can strongly recommend there's a movie which you can view on YouTube called Album 61. And it is uh, the story of Gelfand's match against Anand, but not just the story of his match. Um, Gelfand's father died so, uh, sometime before the World Championship match. And his father had been a fanatical supporter of Gelfand and had made 60 scrapbooks of Gelfand's career, tracking him uh, for height, rating, every, everything, every newspaper cutting uh, about, about his career. And uh, so the one thing he didn't get to see was the World Championship match, and that's, that's the album 61 in the movie. But uh, Gelfand in that match, it was notable that uh, he especially, he was so happy with the match, uh, he, he invited ev just about every chess teacher he'd ever had from the, the woman who taught him when he was five years old to come to Moscow, uh, paid by Gelfand to watch him play and uh, he had huge numbers of uh, supporters and at the end of the match after he lost everyone thought it would be a disappointment for him and he said, no, I just wish it could go on. It was the best month of my life playing this match. It was, uh, why should I be unhappy? I just wish, wish it could happen again. And uh, for Gelfand, it was uh, the, the fight that was important rather than the result. Anyway, so Anand survived. And then only a year later, he had to take on Carlsen. Carlsen had just fallen over the line in the candidates tournament in a really dramatic tournament where he'd lost the final round, but so had his main rival Kramnik and they finished tied and Carlsen got through on a tiebreaker. So Carlsen qualified to play Anand. And it was a bit of a one-sided match. Uh, the early games were interesting, but as soon as Carlsen got the lead, it looked like the wind had completely been taken out of Anand. It looked like he, he didn't believe he could beat Carlsen and Carlsen cruised through to victory. There was one game near the end where you could sort of see Anand get some energy back, but it was a, too little too late and, uh, and Carlsen became world champion. Since then, just as happened with Kramnik, Anand's had this fantastic lease of life. It's as if with the World Championship off his shoulders, he's started to play really well. During that period when he was winning all those world title matches, he hardly won a tournament. He had a four-year drought from winning tournaments. So 
Uh, he, he felt like he was spending all his time preparing for the match. He just couldn't, couldn't play tournament chess. He had a couple of tournaments where he just finished with nine draws out of nine games. It was just horrible to watch. It was, uh, he, he could not get himself going. And yet last year and this year, he's just turned it around. Uh, this year already, uh, he won the Zurich tournament. Well, he tied for first with Nakamura and lost uh, a playoff, but uh, he actually won the classical part of the tournament. Um, he came second uh, just behind Topalov in Norway chess. He came second just behind uh, Carlsen in uh, Shamkir in Azerbaijan. Both scores that Anand got were often winning scores in other tournaments in these events. The, the leaders were doing really well. And uh, so he, he's back with a vengeance. So he, it is amazing to see he's uh, 45 years old and yet ranked second on the, the world ranking list. This is a world ranking list where I'm not sure you have a single player over 50 in the top 100. So 45 is astonishing longevity nowadays. Um, what's that? Is he still in the top 100? Yeah. He fell off briefly, but he's in the top 100. He's like number 63. Uh, he won't be there for long. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> no, OK, you're right. Nigel, he must be early 50s now. I guess 51, 50, 51, yeah. So uh, it's, it is a young man's game at the moment. If you have a look at this tournament, you've got Carlson at 24. Um, well, Caruana, 23, two 21 year olds in So and Giri. You've got the ancient Nakamura at 27. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. Uh, Vachier Lagrave's 24. So, really, the majority of players are under 25 in, in this tournament made up of many of the best players in the world. So, Anand, well, we know what we're going to get with Anand nowadays, and that is he's playing well. Uh, he, he did have one disaster this year. He played in the tournament in Baden-Baden, came in seventh out of eight, and uh, so and that we haven't seen that for a while from Anand. So uh, he's not as consistent as he was, and he does make a few sort of uh, mistakes that we're not used to seeing. But the general level of his game is really quite good. And the one advantage he's got is that having prepared for so many World Championship matches, he's got these openings in the bank where uh, he. He's got a huge bank of ideas that he never got a chance to use in the World Championship match. And uh, I'll just show you one quickly that was uh, very successful uh, quite recently. This is a game Anand played in Zurich this year against Aronian. Uh, it's a Grunfeld defense, which, uh, well, the top players are playing with both colors, and it's Queen B3. So. This is an old system used by a lot in the botvinnik mislov matches. Uh, you know, it hasn't been trendy since Genis Sosonko, the Dutch player, retired, really. Uh, but uh, it's still absolutely playable. And now knight a6. So this is the, the Hort system. There's plenty of decent moves here for black. Um, there's moves like knight fd7, there's bishop g4, there's a6. Uh, a6, the idea of a6 is if you try to stop b5 with a4, then black plays b5 anyway. It's one of these uh, little opening traps. So um, a6, a4, and now b5. Because if you take, which is a blunder, take back, and wherever you move your queen, we take your rook on a1. So, well, you could play rook takes rook and rook takes knight and hope to hang on for a draw, but it's not really what you want out of the opening. So knight a6. So black's idea is to play c5. It'll be a pawn sacrifice, but almost always you can get the pawn back. And that means that uh, white will tend to play d5 after uh, c5. So c5, d5, e6, castles. Actually, this happened a bit in the uh, Karpov-Kasparov World Championship matches. This was one of the lines that they invest investigated in the early matches when uh, Kasparov was playing the Grenfell a bit. And, okay, rook e8, lot, lots of possible moves around here. Bishop f5, okay, d6, and h6 is one of those moves that it takes a while to explain, but it's a, a, a very decent move. And here, uh, Anand comes up with bishop e3. Now, the main line is bishop f4. You could also go um, a3, 
but bishop e3 has the idea after knight g4 to go bishop f4. Now everybody used to think that was completely impossible, but Anand did a bit of work and discovered that it was okay. It's a peace sacrifice, because black can play bishop takes knight. Now if you take back with the queen, we just take the bishop on e2. So you have to take back with the pawn, then comes rook e4, forking the queen and the bishop. Most people would leave it there and not investigate too hard, but Anand took it further. Queen b5, rook takes, queen b7, rook a4. And this position Anand said he had in a very, very old file where he said this is winning for black because after um, you take the knight on a6, then just rook here, queen moves, bishop d7, you can't defend that bishop on a6 anymore and black will finish a piece ahead. So he gave up uh, this idea, but when he came to look at it with a new computer, he said, the computer very quickly said d7 and this is not clear at all. So that pawn turns out to be extremely dangerous. Now remembering of course white is a piece down at the moment. Um, well the first question is whether knight to c7 is playable. It, it doesn't look that way but it turns out after h3 knight goes back, knight e5, knight takes pawn. This is actually close to survivable but it's still not clear. Knight f7 takes, check, takes. Crazy position. Uh, clearly Aronian didn't want to go into this uh, not having analysed it earlier but it does seem to be uh, playable but uh, what an Aronian played is not too bad. It's just you have to follow it up correctly. So Bishop e4 threatening the Queen, Queen b3 and here it turns out you have one good move only and Aronian didn't find it. It looks like Bishop c6 is the most obvious move on the board. Protecting the Rook attacking the d7 pawn, but it turns out it doesn't work. Um, there's, there's really only the one defense here, which is rook a5. And that looks disastrous because of knight d2. That threatens a bishop, it threatens the knight, and the pieces get very tangled. But uh, it also threatens knight c4, trapping the rook. So it looks like it's a winning move. And this is where Aronian gave up. But his computer wouldn't have given up. Uh, as Anand already knew, bishop takes pawn turns out to be playable. Now, if you find that over the board, you're doing really well, especially in a situation where you're already depressed that you've gone into something that they've prepared. But, okay, bishop takes pawn looks crazy, but takes queen g5. It turns out black has a sufficient attack here to compensate, even though he's losing a lot of pieces. Um, c4 is again the sort of move that's hard to find. The queen comes across to g3 and now and just in time. Uh, if you, otherwise knight b3 was strong but here knight b3 we just move our rook <coughs> and uh, black can hold this position but it looks way more risky than what Aronian played but Anand knew exactly what he was doing after bishop c6. Rook d6 and the problem is this is a double attack. It's not just threatening the bishop, it's threatening the pawn on g6 with check as well because of the pin uh, against the king. So rook g6 check is really a deadly threat. Bishop takes and now he could take on g6 but after king f8 maybe uh, he's holding on so he decided just to build up the pressure. You can take on g6 later. Queen b8, take, take, take. You have to keep protecting the knight on a6 and bishop c4. And this, this is more or less collapsed. Even though you've managed to hang on to equal material, f7 is very weak. If you protect that pawn with the rook, we win a piece by taking the pawn on a7. So, well he did that, but... Oh, rook d6, why not take on a7? Oh, knight, knight b4 is a trick. Okay, so rook d6, another double attack, the knight and the g6 pawn and Aronium resigned. 
Um, so, yeah, so really, when, when you get a, get a line that you've, uh, your opponent's prepared and you get something like this, you sort of hope that this will be playable, but it turns out this is losing it much more quickly than anything else. So, uh, and then basically won that on opening preparation. Very, very good opening preparation, but, uh, but it also is an indication of how hard he's prepared to work, I guess, because, um, I'll leave that out, be uh, because this line before d7 was in his files as not playable for white, and he was willing to revisit it, double check even that sort of line, or maybe one of his seconds double checked it, and discover that it was playable. So uh, that's, that sort of hard work is, has, has got him a number of opening points. Okay, equal with Anand in the ratings, 28-16, is another shock, 40-year-old Veselin Topalov, the man who said he was going to retire before, before he was 40. Uh, he said it, it was about five years ago when Anand was 40, and he said he really admired what Anand was doing at age 40, but he could not imagine that he could play uh, on at that sort of age. And partly because Topalov's game is, is a high energy sort of game where uh, he really tries to complicate the game, put pressure on his opponent all the time. Sometimes he pushes too hard, but it's really hard to play against a guy like Topalov who just seems to want to uh, attack you all the time. Um, He's, but the strange thing is, the reason he's still playing at 40 seems to be that he has matured in a way and decided that he doesn't really worry about his results so much anymore. So he's gone from a player who just wants to win all the time to someone who, if it's a draw, it's going to be a draw, I don't mind. Even if I lose, well, it's going to happen sometimes. And he takes losses and misfortune much, much better than he used to. And it's... Uh, the sort of Zen attitude that is really hard for a chess player to have because people tend to regard losses as some sort of insult as against themselves that they were inferior in some way and Topalov has managed to to stay calm so uh, he won the Norway chess tournament in June and he had a lot of lucky breaks uh, most particularly against Carlsen and against uh, Hammer but somehow at, at every press conference he was saying, well, yeah, I won, but it wasn't my fault. It was, you know, I was just chilling and they blundered, so uh, I'm, I'm not worried, and if they'd played okay, I wouldn't have won, but what's the problem? And, uh, and that was continued right through, even though he missed a chance against Nakamura to win and only drew, and exactly the same attitude as after he'd, he'd beaten Carlson, just a shrug of the shoulders, and uh, somehow it's got him up to world number two. Uh, he was world number one uh, when Gary Kasparov retired. He took over for quite a while as world number one. But uh, really the last four or five years haven't been good to him. He came last in a candidates tournament and uh, he, he really felt that his time was over. Uh, and it's, he's still saying he's not sure whether he's going to play the candidates if he qualifies this time. Well, he's almost sure to qualify. Uh, by average rating. He'll be the top rated player who uh, hasn't already qualified by some other way. But um, yeah, it's, it's strange. He's, uh, he says he's got some nice options, I think, in South America to, to go and play at the same time as a candidate, so, so he'll just see. But uh, he really is unambitious now. He also, of course, has a family, so he, he regards that as more important than chess, which is really weird. But uh, anyway, I mean, it's still, it's still world number two, so I can't criticise too heavily. Um, but yeah, so he's played eight Olympiads. Uh, actually, he's always, another player, another of those small group who's always played board one. So he broke into the Olympiad in 1994, uh, the Moscow Olympiad uh, on home territory. He beat world champion Gary Kasparov playing for Bulgaria, and uh, it was an unbelievable debut by Topalov and uh, more or less since then he's been an elite player. But yeah, in 2014 when he came last in the candidates, uh, it, it w was a, a serious blow, but this year he's, he really hasn't played much. He came third in Gibraltar, that's in, uh, at the end of January, and then he played in Norway chess. And we haven't seen him too often, well I think they're the only two tournaments he's played. He might have played some, uh, 
some other games, but that's that's it for serious events. And uh, well, it's done pretty well, but that is not a a sort of schedule of a, a player that is normally staying in great shape. So the bookmakers have actually got him as third uh, least favourite for this event, which is for the equal world number two on the rankings. It's quite remarkable. I think people just sort of don't believe that with that attitude you you can do well, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see Topalov doing very well. And uh, yeah, the, um, well, Topalov, uh, yeah, he, he has had a few setbacks in his career. He's, well, he's had a lot, really. He had the very controversial uh, World Championship match against um, Vladimir Kramnik, where he his team accused Kramnik of cheating. He had the match against Anand, where he only lost on the final game. Uh, but before then, he had a phenomenally successful uh, knockout world championship, which was ultimately won by Kazim Zanov. But Topalov started that event with nine and a half out of ten. So in the first five knockout matches, he won four of them 2-0 and one of them one and a half a half. So that was really an amazing performance. And of course, in the uh, world tournament championship in St. Louis back in 2005, uh, just before the world title was reunified. He, uh, he won that with an absolutely dominating result, scored six and a half from the first seven and left people like Vichy uh, in his wake. So when he's in form, he's, he's a phenomenal player. It's just that we, we thought that, that was it for Topalov, uh, you know, dominating tournaments, but he, he got a great score in Norway, um, what, what we call a plus four score, four, four wins, um, more than losses. He actually won five games and lost one. So it was. Uh, so we'll wait and see how he goes. And the next player I'm going to come to. Oh, actually, well, I, I, I might show you something quick from Tparlov. Because he, okay, the, this is Tparlov in 2007. Carlson's just made it to Vikonse, uh and is playing Aronian's favourite, Queen's Gambit line, the Ragazin. And I just want to show you the phenomenal bit of preparation that came from uh, Topalov. Now here, th this position had been considered roughly equal. Uh, and A3 was simply considered bad. You could play knight 2 but A3 was considered bad because of takes. And you can't take with the rook because of knight 4 And then suddenly Topalov plays rook takes. Carlson plays knight 4 b4, knight takes rook, <coughs> queen a1. And it's an exchange sacrifice, queen here, queen takes. But it turns out to be a phenomenally good one. This, subsequent to this game, many games got played in this line. And uh, well, it's, um, it, it's quite promising for white. It's just hard for black to develop at all. Uh, Carlson actually tried to return the piece immediately which and get his uh, rook to the c file as fast as he could. The idea didn't quite work. He pro uh, bishop d7 turned out to be slightly better. Here, unfortunately, there's no winning of the rook or anything like that, and it only took a few more moves for Carlson to consolidate. Sorry, for Topalov to consolidate. And once he had Carlson resigned, it was a very very early resignation. But White's just got no targets, and bit by bit he's going to consolidate with uh, extra material. So um, it's it's probably a uh, slightly uh, well, it's definitely an early resignation, but uh, there's no doubt White should win it. So uh, the the great thing was coming up with that a3 b4 idea, and then it's a temporary rook sack, but after queen a1. You get a piece back and uh, you dominate the board. Okay, the next person I'd like to come to is um, Hikaru Nakamura. Now, I, I've been saying that Carlson and Anand have had good years, but uh, Nakamura's had a phenomenal year in 2015. Um, he won Gibraltar, uh, which is a big open, but it's a very, very strong open. Uh, he, he won in Zurich. That's, uh, that was a playoff against Anand. Actually, uh, Zurich uses a, a strange combination of 
of rapid and um, uh, classical games for, for the final outcome and uh, it, was, it was Nakamura's superiority at the rapid game followed by uh, winning a blitz playoff against Anand that, that won the tournament. He then won the US Championship. Some of you who uh, hang around St. Louis might have seen that uh, performance. Another really excellent result. Um, and uh, he won the Grand Prix tournament in Candy Mansisk, coming equal first. That Candy Mansisk is in Siberia. It's uh, where the final event in the Grand Prix, this was the event that meant that uh, Nakamura qualified for the candidates tournament. So this will be the first time uh, Nakamura will have a chance to qu challenge for the world title. That will be ne early next year. And he came second in Stavanger. That's the Norway chess tournament which Topalov won. In the end he finished only half a point behind Topalov, which given all the bonus points that Topalov got was, was a pretty decent performance. So uh, second place is the worst that he's managed this year. Uh, he's 27 which you would think would be about your, one of your peak years as a player. Uh, it's very hard to tell nowadays with players coming up at such a young age. You know, Fisher's era, they thought that it was 35 was your peak as a player, 35 to 40. That age has steadily been coming down. Now with Aronian's lack of form, they're thinking you might be over the hill after 30, but it's probably a bit unfair. Yeah, he's been a grandmaster since he was 15, so he's had a long, long period at the top. I, you sort of think that uh, this could be Nakamura's year. Uh, he's found it tough at the Sinkfield Cup. He really hasn't put in any, any great performances here in the, in the first two years, but I think he's just a better player than he used to be. His rating is 28-14, uh, I think. And uh, yeah, he's, well, he's, he's playing uh, the class of chess that, I, in my opinion, is uh, he's probably should be, should be ranked as second in the world. Uh, in terms of consistency and, uh, and general strength. So um, we'll see. I, th I had a nice little example of, yeah, this was the young Nakamura. This is the sort of thing he doesn't do much anymore. Uh, this is a game against Alexander Belyevsky. Belyevsky was a, a famous name in the 1980s, lost an important candidates match against uh, Gary Kasparov on Kasparov's way up. Um, and it's a King's Indian. Belevsky knows a lot about this stuff. Belevsky actually more recently is, uh, has become known as a trainer. He worked with the Muzichuk sisters uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, Maria Muzichuk was the player who won the World, Women's World Knockout Championship uh, only a few months ago. So 92 and now 98. Okay, so uh, 97 is considered better or C5. 98 is considered very, very risky because you're in a race immediately. Your knight is not on d7, so it isn't holding up F, uh, c5 at all. And Nakamura just goes for it. This is an exceptionally crude way of uh, attacking on the king's side. It, it is the typical King's Indian way, but there's a key difference here to a, a normal King's Indian, and that is that knight on d2. Because on d2, it can go to c4 immediately, which is much quicker for the king's, queen side attack than the normal route. Now, the normal king's Indian, the knight goes to e1 and then comes to d3, and it helps the c5 advance. But on d3 itself, it's not a very good square. Whereas here, he's got c5 without needing the help of the knight, which means one knight will come to c4, the other will come to b5, and there will be a huge attack over on the queen side very, very fast and usually before black has got going. So, it doesn't seem to worry Nakamura. He's just pointing everything at the king side. So, he's getting going and takes on c5. Um, now, uh, bishop takes c5 is not a bad move at all. But it, I'll just show you it because uh, it it allowed one of the great finishes in King's Indian games. Okay, here we're in a straight race. Actually, white's playing quite okay. You can't play h3, by the way, because of a sacrifice on h3. And bishop h3. And here, um, you can actually take that bishop on h3, 
queen takes and then rook f2 and it's quite possible white is doing well but instead white took on c7 and allowed this lovely finish wasn't actually played but doesn't want me to play it either and the two knights attack so um, okay it, it's true uh, basically white overlooked the threat of bishop takes followed by queen h3 which is a really really lovely idea but uh, okay Believsky's b6 looks pretty good too so Nakamura just keeps attacking takes and here after rook c7 which uh, is sort of the natural move Believsky apparently spent an hour on his next move um, and so he he finally played knight b5 which allows Nakamura's idea but um, is, is not bad by itself it's just in practice suddenly black is getting some play okay so g3 so you why not take the rook and then Nakamura takes on e4 so he's setting up the same sort of attack with <coughs> queen h4 as fast as possible so the knight simply is getting out of the way so that you can play queen h4 and now Believsky, uh well plays knight e6 which is probably not the, the best move on the board though it's not a disaster it does cut that white squared bishop out of the game so it is sort of natural but after take take takes check It, this position is just really hard to play for white because there's not actually a big threat queen h1 is not a winning threat or anything it's just really hard to move anything so you just don't want to get this type of position in practice so bishop takes pawn and Nakamura just keeps attacking if he could get the pawn on e3 then he would have queen h1 mate so he wants to stop the king running away um, but it turns out not not to work so well um, so apparently rook a2 is okay and then after e3 you just sacrifice on the pawn he tried rook a4 and here's where Nakamura found a, a terrific idea I'm sure uh, Believsky was sort of thinking he'd, he'd stopped everything because e3 is answered by knight takes e3 and there's a pin on the fourth rank against the queen but he switched directions rooks rook attacks the bishop bishop takes pawn b5 absolute classic move so why do you play b5 because if you take on b6 en passant which looks like the best move on the board you've got this amazing check you've cut the bishop out of the game and if queen takes knight takes bishop is mate and wins the queen so you win at least one game that way and rook in the way allows queen h1 mate so after b5 Belevsky had nothing much to do because it turns out to be a pawn fork so he lost his knight and now black can afford to go material grabbing and white resigned since black is a piece up and and with a big attack so that was typical Nakamura young Nakamura yeah in 2009 he was already uh, US champion but it was just not a uh, a very consistent sort of performance and certainly the opening uh, would get punished um, yeah, if white had been a bit more consistent uh, curiously though Nakamura just to prove everyone wrong played that s similar wrong opening against Anand got a similarly disastrous position and also won the game so he, he proved he could sort of swindle King's Indian positions from almost any position uh, and against any level of opposition so Nakamura uh, well he, he's very resourceful but he doesn't get bad positions the way he used to of course okay so Nakamura's fourth seed 
Caruana is fifth. He has dropped down from world number two since the Sinkfield Cup with some reasonable but not, uh, not terrible performances. He came fourth in Zurich, nothing special. He came uh, third in uh, Shamkir behind Anand and Carlsen who are really running away with the tournament. Uh, fifth in Norway chess, nothing special. But he did win um, the Dortmund tournament and he won that with a, a, a closing winning streak of four games in a row. So, and Dortmund is one of the big traditional events. Okay, this doesn't want to load, does it? Uh, hmm. And uh, he also won the Candy Mansis Grand Prix equal with Nakamura and that was of course important for qualifying for the candidates matches. So uh, he hasn't had a terrible year, it's just that uh, yeah, he, he is expected to do more um, because of his fantastic uh, Sinkerfield Cup performance. And uh, well, see, uh, Caruana is only 23, he really burst onto the scene in 2012 where he won a series of tournaments um, in Reykjavik. Uh, he won Dortmund for the first time. He's had a great record in Dortmund. Uh, he came second in Vaikanze. And um, I, he came equal first with Carlsen in the combined Bilbao Linares tournament, uh, which was sort of a, a Grand Slam final, if you like. OK, so Caruana, well, uh, I'm running a bit, a bit late now, so I'll, uh, I'll you can all go and have a look at Caruana's win over Carlson from last year's Sinkfield Cup. It was fantastic. Um, there's uh, the annotated versions up on uh, any of the good websites, Chess24, um, uh, Chess.com have all got excellent coverage of that. There's a musical version on Chess Life Online. Uh, so there's, uh, anyway, it's, a, it's simply a great game. So number six, a player you may not have heard of very much, Anish Giri. Uh, he was actually um, born in St. Petersburg, but moved very young to Japan. Uh, his parents are, uh, his mum's Russian, his dad is Nepali. Uh, he grew up in Japan, and then uh, he moved as a teenager to the Netherlands, uh, where he's been, he's now only 21, but um, he became a grandmaster at only 14. He's a top Dutch player. Uh, he just won the Dutch Championship again, and he's, without being, uh, without winning too many of the really elite tournaments, he's worked his way up the ranking list, a little bit like Wesley So, who hasn't really had the, the huge breakthrough tournament performances yet, but he's, he's good enough to hold his own against these players, and, uh, well, Geary has the, uh, ama uh, one, he's the one top player who has a, a plus score against Carlsen. Uh, Carlson has managed to dominate a lot of the other opponents, um, built up a massive score now against Aronian, uh, yeah, big scores against other players, most other players, but against Geary, Geary's made seven draws and won one, and uh, he doesn't seem to want to add to that one win, maybe because he doesn't want to have a, a one appearing in the other column, but uh, he's, he certainly ribs Carlson about his record uh, every time they meet, and Carlson definitely seems to be a little bit irritated by this kid that he can't beat, because remember that Giri's three years younger than uh, Carlson. Giri uh, got married a couple of months ago uh, to Sotiko Guramashvili, who you may have seen her out there, uh, and uh, that should add about 50 rating points to his rating, but we'll see if that theory holds. Um, this year, he came equal second in Vikonse, which was not a bad result, but nearly half the field came equal second. Um, he came fourth in Norway, which was very respectable, but nothing outstanding. Uh, had a modest result in Shamkir, modest result at the Grand Prix in Kani Mansisk. Uh, Giri still got a small chance of qualifying for the candidates on rating. He really needs a good result here. Uh, and he could overtake Kramnik uh, for the, um, he may already be level with Kramnik uh, for the, the final position on rating, but certainly Giri is, uh, well, up around the 2800 mark now for quite a while. Um, uh, so no one really wants, uh, wants to tip him to win. Of course he's going to have a big breakthrough sometime, but no one really sees him winning enough games against these top players to win. But somehow 
when you're 21 and you're 27, 93, you, uh, you have the capability to beat anybody. And uh, I, I think, yeah, either Geary or so, it feels like this might be a tournament where they, uh, they break through. Now, Wesley So, uh, as many of you know, is uh, recently transferred, well, a year ago from the Philippines to uh, the United States. He uh, has had a pretty good year, um, second in Vacanze, second in Dortmund, but uh, it was the third place in the US Championship, of course, that attracted all the headlines. Um, he won a lot of games in that tournament, but he also lost a terrible short game to Vara Kobian, where Kobian played eight good moves and there wasn't much So could do about it, and the Arbiter forfeited him. Um, this was the, the infamous writing messages game where um, Wesley had a habit of, uh, and he'd been doing it for quite a while, but without being picked out for it, of just writing little notes to himself like, um, remember to play well, or um, yeah, look at the clock sometimes, or this sort of thing, just little inspirational messages. And uh, the Arbiter had warned him early in the tournament that you're really not supposed to write notes to yourself. Um, and he had then given him a second warning and uh, that the day that he played a, a Kobian, um, it was the third strike and he was out. And uh, so he lost that game. It was pretty hard to recover when you lose a game like that. Um, and to finish third in the tournament was actually quite commendable. But unfortunately, that's what everyone remembers the tournament for, the, uh, the very quick game against a Kobian. Uh, the, I mean, at first, every, when it was first stopped at that moment, everyone assumed it was a mobile phone loss because you, you get quite a few games nowadays where some player forgets to turn their phone off. And uh, well, the, the classic was when they first introduced the, the rule. The very first victim of the mobile phone rule was uh, the world knockout champion, uh, Ruslan Ponomariev, whose mum was ringing him to tell him it was his birthday and happy birthday. And uh, so that was, that was the very first phone forfeit. And once they'd done it to the, the world champion, they sort of felt that they could <laughs> enforce it against anybody. So, uh, so yeah, so everyone assumed that he'd left his mobile on, but in fact, um, it was worse than that. So, well, we'll, we'll see how Wesley uh, goes. He, um, he's actually played four Olympiads for the Philippines, but the last Olympiad in Tromsø, he was a trainer for the US team. He wasn't eligible to play for the US yet, but he will be eligible at the next Olympiad. So. Uh, he's been living in the US for quite a while because he went to Webster University um, and uh, well he, he's worked his way up to world number seven although as someone pointed out last night he just got overtaken by Ding Li Ren uh, who's playing in the club matches in China they have what you call live rating lists nowadays so instead of waiting every six months for ratings <coughs> or three months or one month now you actually it, it's it's updated as it happens and uh, well, so Wesley's dropped from seven to eight without actually picking up a pawn. Wesley's just come from the Turkish league where he had a reasonable performance, uh, not quite what he would have hoped, but I think he was looking for a workout before this tournament and he got quite a few tough games there. He lost a game to Chaparinov, the longtime second of Tapalov, but uh, he won some, won some decent games and I think he'll be fairly happy with the way things are going. Uh, it's very useful to do something. I know Carlson was at a training camp with Aronian just before this tournament and uh, you, you just need to get your eye in because the big danger in the early rounds is that you just blunder and uh, you need to feel like you're playing right from the start. So there are some players who just traditionally start very slowly but now the modern players, they, they want to be in form right from round one and uh, Worthley's way of doing that is to was to play a, a, a tough uh, team tournament in Turkey. Okay, uh, number eight in this tournament, world number nine, is Alexander Grishuk. And he has had a bit of a fall in the last 12 months or so. He, he was established as world number three for a while. He got up around 2800. Uh, and well, he's still not that far from 2800, but he's had a pretty awful year, not played that much, but uh, came in sixth in the Grand Prix in Kenny Mansisk, though he wasn't a chance to qualify for the candidates anyway. He came seventh in Norway chess, which was pretty disappointing. So he's, he's really not, look, not looked good this year. Um, so he's, 
he's certainly uh, yeah, won a huge number of uh, tournaments in his career. He's, he's actually 31, so he's, he's younger than uh, Aronian, and yet a lot of his good results are quite a few years back. I mean, the Russian Championship uh, in 09, I think he won Linares in the same year. Linares was a big tournament in Spain uh, that uh, was one of the elite events in the world. But even as long ago as last year, he, he won the Petrosian Memorial Tournament, uh, which was also a very strong event in Russia. So he, he certainly can still play. It's just uh, unclear exactly why his form's gone downhill. I don't think it's so much poker. I mean, he is a very strong poker player, but uh, I think he, he certainly prepares hard for tournaments. He did admit in Norway just last year that he sometimes struggled for motivation uh, in tournaments, especially classical tournaments where he wasn't doing so well. But uh, if there's anything that can motivate him, you'd hope it would be more or less the strongest tournament held since 1938. So maybe this, uh, this tournament will uh, see the best in Grishuk. And when he plays well, he is a fantastic player. Uh, I mean, so, some of his best games are, are really aggressive, crushing games. Um, I'll quickly show you... OK, I'll, I'll race through the early moves. It's, uh, it's from the Candidates Tournament back in 2007, long time back. Um, it's a Sicilian, a normal Schäveningen in Sicilian. Uh, if you want to know how to play this, you should just check out um, Gary Kasparov's books of his match against Anatoly Karpov because they were discussing this opening non-stop, especially in the, uh, the early matches. Uh, A4 was, is, was played a lot in those matches too. This is a slightly different line to that which Karpov and Kasparov had. And B4, okay, hadn't been invented that early. So White's playing B4, B5, it all looks like fun, but actually you're leaving behind a lot of weaknesses on the C file. So if black can get a rook on c8 and a queen on c7, you might wish that you hadn't pushed your pawn so fast. But okay, this is still opening theory, e5, and then this queen c7 move, um, b6, queen c6, and here, um, yeah, Grishuk had uh, had played this, uh, I think, with uh, the black pieces as well. But, okay, you can't take the knight because the bishop takes f6 and after bishop f3, d5. And again, if you take the knight, bishop takes f6. But here's where uh, Grishuk had a, a great idea. He played rook a1, doesn't seem to be doing terribly much. The knight saved itself and then suddenly knight takes d5. Take, take. <coughs> queen c5 to make sure the queens come off the board. And yet Grishuk doesn't mind. And he gets this end game, a piece down, but with a huge attack. And it turns out, even after knight f6, you just move the bishop back, and black is under all sorts of pressure. So if you take on e6, then we take with the rook, and we'll get the e7 bishop. So rook d8, and now he decides to cash in. Takes. If you take with the bishop, we have e7. If you take with the pawn, we take on f7. So check first, e7 anyway, and this ending, although white's only a pawn up, is huge because of threats of rook takes c6 and that sort of thing. And rook e1, yeah, a great follower. So he's, he's giving away g2, but if you take with the rook, then we have um, rook takes bishop on c6, and if you take with the bishop, we just play king g1, and we're just threatening to put our rook on the seventh rank, and your f7 pawn is in trouble. So rook here, still giving away pawns in order to get to the seventh, and now the ending is pretty hopeless. He's still trying for rook g2 check, but now... And if you take back, b7 queens. So he tries to get back with the rook, but c3 makes sure he doesn't. And that's check. But, uh, so, but there's no way back here. So that, that was uh, a line that had seemed to be nothing for white, but Grishuk saw this long-term peace sacrifice 
and it wasn't winning by force it was very good defense but it was around here especially rook e1 just not going defensive and most people would play rook g1 automatically he, he just decides to keep attacking and not worry about the g2 pawn and uh, it works extremely well so that uh, yeah that, that was a very um, impressive game okay that's Grishuk Aronian is like the enigma nobody knows what's happened in the last 18 months 18 months ago he sat down to play the candidates tournament he was 28 30 he was the favorite to win the tournament round one he sits down to play Anand and well something goes terribly wrong and I'll, I'll actually show you what went terribly wrong by showing you a Wesley So game uh, okay here's the line that Anand and Aronian played Aronian was black he knows his stuff really well he plays castles in order to play a martial gambit h3 is a method of avoiding it take take you can take on e5 but knight d2 queen d7 this was Aronian's great new move takes 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 knight f4 now Aronian had got this position and he played knight f6 he at some moment um, Anand gave back the pawn and won a very nice end game and Aronian basically never recovered in the candidates tournament Anand went on to qualify to play Carlsen again but um, soon after the game uh, a number of people independently discovered that knight f4 is close to winning for black um, so the idea is after knight f3 you go take take a5 and that has a double threat even though it doesn't look it the double threat is both a4 trapping the bishop and rook a6 followed by rook g6 with a winning attack uh, sometimes rook f6 is also pretty good but usually rook g6 and you, uh, Ivanchuk against uh, Wesley simply didn't know this this was January this year and uh, he went on to lose this game very heavily Aronian found out soon after the game he was very critical of his seconds um, he uh, well asked them why they hadn't found it in fact he joked that he sacked them uh, I hope he didn't sack them on the spot because he still had a candidates tournament to play but uh, certainly he wasn't, wasn't very happy and uh, it turned out to be an enormously expensive point uh, I mean there have been historically there have been some classic misses by seconds um, there's a, a famous one where uh, Kramnik lost to Lecco this is the 2004 World Championship match where uh, it was a sharp line also of the Marshall attack and um, Kramnik had worked out a very clever queen sacrifice where he gets an unstoppable pawn really nice line but unfortunately one of uh, Kramnik's seconds um, didn't quite analyze it far enough um, and the final position where they said to Kramnik go ahead it's great play it uh, if he left his computer on another 10 minutes it would have said don't play it you're losing and Lecco at the board sat down worked out how to play it and won what looked like it was going to be the decisive game of the world championship match in fact Kramnik fought back and and won the final game of the match and uh, leveled the match and held on to his title but it was n near fatal and, and this game just about cost Aronian uh, a ca candidate's place of the of course who knows what would have happened after then but it certainly made a massive difference to him so since then he's gone from world number two where he had been for many years to world number 11 I mean this year is typical ninth in Vikanze fourth in Zurich that's only a, a six player tournament uh, fifth in Baden an eight player tournament equal fifth at that ninth out of ten in Stavanger I mean these are not fantastic results and nobody is quite sure why he's you know 32 years old he's the only thing he really hasn't won is uh, the world championship title because he's led Armenia to three gold medals at the Olympiads he's won Vikanze he's won practically every big tournament but something's gone wrong 
Uh, I mean, just before the candidates tournament, he won Vacanze again, which was a, another really strong event. So, uh, yeah, he's, it, it's completely unclear what, what's going on. And uh, you would, as I say, you wouldn't think 32 would be over the hill. And it shouldn't be. Uh, yeah, he's, he's still capable of playing well, but uh, there's some, been something missing, too many blunders. He's really become Carlson's bunny in the last couple of years. Uh, Carlson seems to be able to win almost any position against him. If you recall, that, that started happening in the, uh, the first Sinkerfield Cup in the last round. Aronian built up a near winning position against Carlson uh, and then let it, squandered it. And then Carlson even knocked back a draw and went on to win uh, when a draw would have got him the title. So uh, you've also got to realize Aronian used to beat up Carlson a lot when Carlson was a kid. So Aronian did have this psychological edge over Carlson. He used to beat him in drawn rook endings a lot in particular. And uh, it's, but, but uh, well, who knows? It'd be great to see Aronian play well again. It was very interesting to see that he had done training with, with Carlson before this tournament. You sort of always viewed them as huge rivals since Aronian was always the guy most likely to challenge for the title. But now maybe uh, they, they sort of feel like they're colleagues or something. Uh, Carlson having had a disaster in Norway and knowing how Aronian feels a bit, I don't know. So uh, anyway, I'd, Aronian is completely capable of winning this tournament, but we need the Aronian of two years ago and not uh, the Aronian that's been turning up in the last 12 months. And the final player in the field, uh, Maxim Vacher Legrave. No one thinks he can win. Um, that he's still rated 27.31, which is pretty decent. Um, he came second in Vicance, and most recently, uh, he's the player, the top player, who's most recently won a big tournament. He won uh, the big event in Biel in Switzerland uh, at the end of August, and he's now won that tournament four times. When he first won it, it was about 2000. And Nine, he was still a teenager and uh, uh, it was a huge shock. But uh, subsequently, he's won the last three Beals in a row. Yeah, Beal attracts perhaps not the Anands and Carlsons of the world, but players like Morozovic, uh, Ivan Chalks, really strong, strong players. And uh, somehow Vache keeps winning that event. Uh, so, yeah, he's, he's absolutely able to beat top players. He was a semi finalist in the World Cup 2013 which is not easy at all. That's the knockout tournament. So he, uh, he can play well, but what has held him back is when he plays badly, he plays pretty badly. Um, so seventh in Stavanger equal with Carlsen wasn't great, but last in Candy Mansisk at the Grand Prix tournament was a complete disaster. And uh, that cost him, I think, a lot of, well, a lot of places on the world ranking list. But he's, uh, he's pulled himself together the last few tournaments. And uh, you sort of hope that uh, you'll see uh, Vache, who really is a calculating machine. I mean, he, is, he sits there and believes that he can outcalculate any top player. Even when he lost to Carlsen, I think it was in um, Shamkir, uh, it was a very nice game by Carlsen. But Vache took him on. He, Carlson made a move that was a positional pawn sacrifice and Vache had a good look at it and decided he could survive. He could, but long term Carlson got him. But he, even so, he, he's just very brave. Grishuk is another player who's almost unbluffable. Um, that they will take on these guys if they think they've made a mistake. Um, sometimes it costs them because uh, they're, they're sort of taking too many risks. But, yeah, well, Vache. Clearly, a 50% result will be a decent performance here, but, and he's completely capable of doing better. But he's the one player in the field that it's very hard to see him actually winning the tournament. Um, but if you give him the sort of start that Topal have had in Norway, then, uh, then who knows? You do, I mean, there, there is luck in chess. And uh, you know, if Vachier gets it and gets a bonus point here or there, then uh, he'll be right up there. And he has, he has led some of these events early on. He won his first game in Norway. He beat Aronian. He was looking good for a, a little while, but eventually the, the one strong opponent after another got to him. Anyway, so this is what we've got to look forward to.
over the next uh, 11 days, um, really you won't see, uh, you're unlikely to see a stronger tournament in your lifetime. It's so hard to get all these players together. Um, with the one player, top player missing uh, who would have been invited was Vladimir Kramnik. He's obviously reaching near the end of his, his full-time chess career. You'll probably see him play occasionally, but perhaps a tournament like this is not so much to his liking anymore. I wouldn't be surprised if Anand and Topalov, they will keep playing uh, top events, but it will be harder and harder to get them in a, in a lot of top events. So they'll probably uh, pick and choose a little bit more. So to get everyone together for this uh, Grand Chess Tour, and in particular for this uh, Sinkerfield Cup, has been an amazing achievement. I was uh, incredibly impressed when they announced who they'd signed up at the start of the year because uh, you know, there's, there's been efforts before to get all the top players together. Uh, you know, Los Palmas back in the 90s got five out of the top six, but usually there's, there's a few who the timing doesn't work. It's and not that they don't want to come to a particular event, but uh, it just doesn't suit their schedule. But this, is, this year has an advantage. It's a non-world championship year, so you don't have two players who are absolutely tied up in in candidates tournaments followed by world championships and so on. So this is a chance to get all of the guys together. Um, it may be a reason why the World Chess Tour will be a little bit harder to, to organize next year, but uh, well, enjoy it while you can. This is, uh, th this is an absolute stellar event and uh, I think what we're gonna see is, is something fantastic. So enjoy. Mm -hmm.